Before we move on to the video, if you are looking for more lease study material, please do not hesitate to contact me on my email and on my LinkedIn. In addition to the material, I have also developed a file in which I have put all the credit categories with their respective names, adaptations to which they apply, their description, their details, furthermore required documentations, formulas, and the standards they follow in a tabular form and color coded. And all the important terminologies related to that credit categories are stated below. Feel free to contact me and I'll be more than happy to share all with you. Hello and welcome. We're going to discuss about the location and transportation credit category. The maximum number of points that a building or project can earn is 16 apart from core and shell adaptation that can earn 20, school can earn 15, and healthcare 9. This is the complete summary that shows all the credits for this category and their respective adaptation how many points they can earn in the categories. In general, the intent of this credit category of location and transportation is to take advantage of existing infrastructure, already developed land, uh, and it should provide easy access to public transportation and reducing the environmental burden of vehicles and promotes walkability. If you see now that if you have an access to public transportation, you're going to reduce the environmental burden in a way that if you use your personal vehicle to transport to a certain building or a project, you're going to have uh, these carbon emissions. But when you come in uh, in the public transport, it's going to reduce the burden because there are so many number of people inside the public transport and the per head emissions will be less. Same if uh, you walk to the to the building, it's going to be less number of emissions. So this is the general idea. Credit number one, lead for neighborhood development and location, minimum eight, maximum 16 points. And the intent is almost the same, to reduce uh, vehicle distance travel, enhance human health, promote walkability and physical activity. Uh, the requirement of this credit is that project is to be located in the neighborhood that is lead for neighborhood development certified. If you recall the rating system, the fifth one was lead for neighborhood development. So if your neighborhood is certified uh, by a lead rating system previously, you can just put your project, the new lead building inside this neighborhood and gain the number of points. If you see that there were two adaptations, the plan and the build project for uh, lead for neighborhood development, there were some rating systems or uh, before version 4 of, of LEED. So if the project of uh, neighborhood development was certified before LEED V4, it, it could have been stage, stage 2 or stage 3 of LEED neighborhood devel uh, development certified under LEED 2009 or LEED pilot project. Uh, and in case of uh, version 4, it should be LEED uh, certified ND plan or ND build project. Uh, this list can be uh, you can uh, find it on USDBC's website that which projects are certified under LEED and D plan. So if you have placed or located your project in one of the certified projects from LEED uh, for neighborhood and development, then this is the table through which you can earn the points. If your certification level for LEED neighborhood and development was certified silver, gold, and platinum. And based on these certifications, you can earn your uh, project, uh, project points for this credit based on if your project is which kind of adaptation. I think this table explains it all. But the main thing that is to be noted here is that the project applying for this credit cannot earn any other credit from location and transportation, which we are going to have a look now. So if you submit for this uh, credit category you cannot submit anything for the rest of the credits and the documentation basically to be submitted for any credit is that you have to certify or you have to show to GPCI and USGPC that you have uh, fulfilled all the requirements so in this case you have to submit the project information for the lead ND certified the, its name, rating, and all all the certification level and date that it uh, it was uh, certified, and a map showing your project boundary with respect to the lead ND project boundary. 
Credit number two, uh, sensitive land protection. It's kind of straightforward. The intent and requirement is the same, to reduce environmental impact and to avoid development on any sensitive land. So you have multiple options to achieve uh, the intent of this or requirement of this credit. The first one is straightforward, development footprint on previously developed land. You just need to show GBCI by your documentation that your project is placed in an area or located in, in uh, on a previously developed land. For that, you can submit uh, the previous development explanation and the current project uh, project map showing boundary and footprints, etc. By the way, the land altered by land clearing, agriculture, or forest activity is not previously developed. Any other development that has uh, been made on any land would qualify for the previous development. Now, the option either you can go for option one to fulfill the requirement and earn one point for Corin Shelley's two points, or you can earn select second option to avoid development on five types of sensitive land. That is farmland 100 feet from water bodies, 50 feet from wetlands, floodplains, and endangered species zone. There are some exceptions, we're going to see that. Now, in the document, you just need to show your project maps with the boundary and how you determine or how the criteria of the sensitive land is being verified. So if you see, these are the types of uh, the sensitive land we just discussed. And below, for example, this Natural Resources Conservation Service, Federal Emergency Management Agency, these are uh, the sources or the agencies that verify that these areas fall in a certain floodplain or farmland category. And these are the wetland and water body exceptions we just talked about. You can go through them. Credit number three, high priority site. One to two points for uh, new construction, major renovation, and core and shell, two to three points. The intent or requirements is kind of same to encourage uh, project location in areas with uh, development constraints and promote health of the surrounding area. It could be uh, a historic site or vacant or underutilized sites that could benefit uh, low and in uh, income communities when redeveloped or contaminated site we can see it uh, through the options the option number one is uh, the project location in historic district or an infill site uh, infill site is uh, where 75 percent of land area is within half mile uh, or within half mile of the project is previously developed uh, rights of way should not be included in the calculations. And for the documentations to prove, we just need to show a vicinity map within half mile of the project boundary. And we have to document of historic location confirmation. Just like we had uh, a document to submit for uh, the sensitive land, how we uh, verified that certain area is uh, falling under the category of uh, farmland and sector. Same goes for here for the historic location. Uh, the agencies we discussed before, even in the sensitive land, uh, are in USA, but you can have local equivalents that can uh, declare any location to be historic or farmland, etc. Now, this is the option one. We can either opt for this one or we have the second option. The second option is that the project could be located in any federal priority listed sites could be empowerment zone, federal uh, enterprise community. All these communities are in U.S. You could have a local equivalent in, in your own country. And you just need to show to earn the credit that the project is located in this priority designation areas. Now, the third option is that project could be in a brownfield area that require remediation. Uh, by the way, the contamination would be considered for soil and groundwater only. And again, for the documentation, just the confirmation that contamination was there and also to show that remediation is done up to the satisfaction. There, there is a chance of uh, getting an exemplary uh, performance point. That is if you uh, fulfill the requirements or option one and either of the option two or three, you can get or earn an extra point in high priority site. Credit for surrounding density and diverse uses. The requirement or intent is kind of same, encourage development in land with existing infrastructure. So if you have an uh, existing infrastructure, it means that uh, the area 
around the project is densely populated or significantly populated. So for the option one, you will draw uh, 400 meters or, or one by four miles of radius around the project and it should meet the surrounding density of the following table. You've got the residential density, you've got the non-residential density, and a combined density of both of them. This DU per acre, it's, it, it is uh, dwelling units. Dwelling units are just the homes. And uh, FAR is floor area ratio, as we know. And uh, the formulas are given. And these are the numbers that uh, DU per acre should be 7 uh, or 12, respectively, giving you the points for uh, 2 and 3, and so on and so forth. The documentation, you just need to show that your uh, project is inside the area or uh, the radius around is in the existing residential and non-residential uh, density as required. And in the, the second option is uh, the option number two has the relation of and with option number one. So you can opt for both options and gain more points. Option two, along with the option one, is that the project location is at a walking distance from four to eight plus diverse users around half mile from the main entrance. We've got three things here, walking distance, diverse users, and main entrance. If you see the figure below, you can see the main entrance with a black dot. So the walking distance from the main entrance would be considered the actual walking distance through the streets, not the other way around. Now for the diverse uses, you can see that there is a category that LEED has defined. Could be food, retail, community servicing, retail, and then there are the different subcategories. This is for the guideline. It doesn't mean that these are the only uses, but anything that can fall under certain categories for diverse uses will be qualified here. And the categories, there are one, two, three, four, and five types of categories that are defined. Now, if you want to earn any points, minimum three to five categories should be covered and not more than two types per category can be counted for example in this case if you go to the services it could be a bank and hair care but more than this you cannot put inside or you cannot count because you already covered two types in a certain category and in following this example you have to have uh, from your project within the walking distance four to seven types uh, to gain one point and eight plus to gain two points. Documentation could be as simple as a map showing the distances to the diverse users and their type. This uh, map which we just saw earlier is a best example where you can see your project, your main entrance, the types of uh, the diverse users and the number of them and it even has a small scale that shows that how far they are from your main entrance of your project. Uh, the healthcare only has a little difference from uh, this major uh, renovation and new construction. That is that the relationship between the options for new construction is and whereas for the healthcare it's or. You can either go for option one or opt for option two and if you meet the requirements you will only gain one point. But there is another restriction that you have to consider minimum seven diverse users. In case of uh, major renovation and new construction, you could have four diverse users and still gain one point. What we have discussed so far in surrounding density and diverse users, if you recall the intent of the requirement was to encourage development in land with existing infrastructure. But when it comes to the warehouse, it does not serve the purpose because the warehouse, the in and out and the most uh, most of the traffic is not of people but of goods and, and materials. So LEED has a different criteria to fulfill the requirement of this particular credit which it called uh, the option number one uh, is development and ages, uh, adjacency uh, to construct on previously developed site that was used for industrial or commercial purposes. In this case you are serving the same purpose that it is developed in the land with existing infrastructure which suits the warehouse. It's going to gain you two points and if you construct or renovate on both previously developed and adjacent to the existing site used for commercial or industrial purposes, it means you are in the same area. So you have not even uh, developed in uh, a previously developed area but you are also adjacent 
to the side that are using the same facilities serving this uh, this intent and requirement so it's going to give you three points the adjacency could be at least 25 percent of its uh, boundary with the existing site for the documentation again the map previous development and any commercial industrial site adjacent to the project could be shown and you can earn the points and the option two which in relation to option one could be earned the option number two is the transportation resources if you have 10 mile driving from uh, main logistics hub which could be an airport or a seaport anything uh, similar one mile drive from uh, on a ramp to highway one mile drive from active freight rail line and served by active rail freight spur what's the difference between the two active freight la uh, rail line is uh, the, the cargo train you might see and the rail freight spur is kind of shoulder lines on which you can load and unload materials so if you have any of two or three sources that are of uh, these uh, transport you can gain one point and if four or more you can gain two points again it serves the same requirement or the intent that it's in the existing infrastructure and the documentation you just need to show them is the project and transport resources even if the transport resources are not available right now but they are planned within 24 months you can submit to earn this credit credit five access to quality transit one to five points for all adaptations except for core and shell one or six for schools one to four and for healthcare up to two points the intent here is to encourage development in areas which have multimodal transportation choices if you've got these transportation choices you're gonna reduce the the use of your personal uh, vehicle and that's gonna reduce the carbon emissions and that's one of the choices or one of the uh, top priorities for LEED. Now the requirement for two to three points uh, is that the project main entrance with walking distance of around quarter mile from bus and streetcar and half mile from rapid bus rail or ferries now we know what is walking distance and how we can project it and the minimum trip count is necessary we're going to see it in the next slide and services again could be existing or planned now these are uh, the transportation modes we are talking about normal bus is different now what's the difference between the bus rapid transit and the normal bus the bus rapid transit has its dedicated lane so it's different from from a bus and the streetcar is kind of a tram uh, it does not have too many people on board at once and you can uh, consider it to be the the tram uh, in in different uh, areas of the world the light rail is sort of the tubes and the metros in the cities we can find uh, the ferry we all know it takes huge number of people and even uh, your vehicle can can go on the ferry and the, the commuter rail is uh, the big rail intercity which takes a lot of passengers uh, in in one go and it has usually the longer distances the commuter rail and the ferry comes from long distances as compared to light rail streetcar and bus rapid transit now the minimum daily transit services which we saw that the minimum trip count this is the minimum trip count and this these are the number of points that you are going to earn you have weekday trips you have weekend trips this is combined for bus streetcar rail or ferry the first table and the second one if only with the commuter rail and ferry services as, as I uh, discussed that the commuter rail and the ferry that takes a big number of people with them so that's why the, uh, the trip count is smaller for the documentation again map showing the entrance walkable distances as required by the credit and you have to show the timetables for all these uh, multimodal transport in order to show the minimum count compliance and it's again acceptable if it is uh, planned in advance for 24 months you can submit and earn the credit now if you see we covered uh, the new construction and core and shell for the school there's a, a little bit of different criteria the main idea being that all this uh, one, uh, quarter mile from bus streetcar and half mile from rapid bus rail or ferries the, uh, the main thing is that since the school doesn't work on weekends so weekend trips are taken away from uh, the minimum trip count and the number of points are distributed a little bit differently as per the table here documentation remains the same timetables to be submitted and the map showing entrances 
and walkable distances. There is a second option for the schools to earn a point. For option two, if the project team is able to show that certain percentage of students live within the pedestrian access, complete pedestrian access means from their home to the school without disconnection, uh, three quarter miles walking distance for eighth class or a age 14 or less students, and one and a half walking, uh, miles walking distance for ninth class students age 15 or above. If they are able to show that 50% of such students live uh, within the pedestrian access, they can earn one point, 60 for two, and 70 or more, they can earn four points. And for the documentation, they just need to prove that uh, these number of students live uh, this far from school, and these are their ages. The healthcare is exactly the same as the new construction or major renovation. The only difference is the number of trip counts are being reduced. You have only now two options uh, for weekday and weekend trips. There is no third row and you can earn maximum of two points. All the necessary requirements and documentation remain the same. And on top of it, we have an exemplary performance of one point that you can earn by doubling the highest transit service point threshold except for school projects pursuing option number two because it has nothing to do with the trip count but it has to uh, it has to have certain number or percentage of students living in the vicinity of the school so it does not qualify but rest of them can qualify for the exemplary performance credit six bicycle facilities one point for all adaptations for the, uh, but a little change in the requirement the intent is straightforward and clear to promote bicycling, to enhance human health, promote physical activity, and of course reduce motor vehicle use. The first requirement or the first part of the requirement is the bicycle network. You should have a bicycle network around your project because it should be, the network should be 200 yards walking distance from either of your bicycle storage or functional entry. And the storage, the bicycle storage, long term or short term should be within 100 feet from the main entrance. Now the second uh, part of uh, bicycle network is or the requirement part is that it should either connect to 10 diverse uses. We know diverse uses we just uh, uh, know from the previous credit and either to a, a 10 diverse uses, school, ferry or bus terminal and all these destinations should be within three miles from your project. So this is the requirements for the bicycle network. The second is storage and shower facilities. You can have short-term storage, you can have long-term storage. So in order for uh, to, to achieve the requirement of the credit for commercial projects specifically, you should have 2.5% short-term storage for peak visitors but no less than four spaces per building and 5% long-term storage for occupants and no less than four spaces per building. And these two spaces should be separated from each other. You should have separate short term and separate long term. You cannot have four for long and short, no, four short separate and four long term uh, separate storages. Uh, also, they have decided that there should be 1% of uh, shower facilities for the first 100 occupants. You, sh you should have one side shower and changing facility. And then for 150 occupants thereafter, you should have one. This is done by USGBC uh, consensus, the members decided so. There should be side shower facilities and short and long term storage. For residential projects, the first part, the bicycle network, the requirements remains the same and even the uh, first part of bicycle storage to provide 2.5 short term storage for peak visitors remain the same, no less than four spaces per, per building. But in case of long term storage, now you have to provide either one space per unit or at least 30% for 30% of the occupants. This is for, for the residential part. That minimum requirement is they should have one space per unit. And if it exceeds, then 30% for the occupants, whichever is higher. And there is no shower facility requirement here because in uh, the dwelling units or in the uh, housing units, you have the shower facilities in the, in the washroom. Just to have an idea, this is how a short term and long term storage looks like. Uh, the main difference is that for the short term, you might not have that high security and uh, you might not have uh, the weather protection. But in case of long term storage, you have uh, much better security because it is inside and is also weather protection. 
Now for the mixed projects, you could have a part residential, part non-residential. You have the requirements for residential and requirements for non-residential. So whatever percentage of your project, of your misuse project, is uh, for residential part, you follow those requirements. And for the non-residential part or commercial part, you follow those requirements. And you can uh, earn the credit. For the documentation, we all know now that we just need to submit the proof. So you have to submit the site plan showing number of storage, the occupancy calculation, uh, if there is any shower facility, uh, diverse uses if uh, you have submitted for uses or for the transits or school. You have to just show that the network is there and the distance for the network is less than three miles or within the three miles. For healthcare, it's the same as commercial part, but when you are making the occupancy calculations, the patients should not be included inside. Otherwise, the requirements, storage and shower facility, all are the same. For the retail adaptation, the network requirements remains the same. And for the storage now, the short-term storage, you should have two short-term storages for every 5,000 square feet of the, build, of the GFA you have in the project. But it should not be less than two per building. So if you have less than 5,000 square feet, minimum you should have two bicycle storage short term for the building and for the long term spaces uh, you should have five percent for regular building occupants which in this case would be the employees the side shower and changing facilities requirements remain the same but you should have now in order to earn this credit you should have a bicycle maintenance program for your employees and documentation will be the same what we just saw in the new construction and major renovation but now you should have a description of maintenance program which you are offering to the employees. For school adaptation, in addition to the bicycle network requirements, you should have now the bicycle lanes extended to the school property which ensures the safety and security for the students. Should be inside uh, the school property without the barriers. And in, in case of uh, the bicycle storage, you should have now 5% long-term storage for regular building occupants including staff and for uh, class students and above and it should not be less than four spaces per building the shower facility requirements remain the same but now it should not exclude the students should be only for the staff so for the uh, long-term storage staff plus students four graders and above and for the facility a shower facility it should not include students for the documentation now you have to show that the bicycle networking distance uh, to diverse uses if you claim for that and uh, if for the transits and uh, you have to show that the main entrance and bicycle route are uh, in the walking distance and it's uh, extended to the school boundary on the site plan credit number seven reduced parking footprint one point for all adaptations and if you have a reduced parking footprint on your project definitely you're going to go for um, alternative or multimodal transport you gonna you might think of walking to the to the project or bicycle it also has an environmental impact if you reduce the parking facilities it's gonna help you in land use reduction and rainwater runoff rainwater one run, uh, runoff I'm gonna touch it a little in the next slide but we're gonna see it in more detail when it comes in sustainable site uh, rainwater management uh, credit so for the requirement here to earn this credit that your parking should not exceed minimum local code parking requirements your country might have uh, a certain body that gives you the guidelines of what is the minimum parking requirement for a certain size of the project or certain far of the project including the adaptation or type of the project then recommended par uh, uh, recommended by parking consultant you have to reduce parking in two cases case number one if you have not uh, earned any points in surrounding density and diversity which means that you are not in an area which is uh, densely populated and you do not have so many things around or services around you because you have earned no point in uh, surrounding density and diversity in this case the reduction percentage is only 20 percent but if you have earned any points in surrounding density and diverse uses, the previous credits we just saw, then you have to reduce by 40%, which means you have uh, a developed infrastructure 
and you have uh, so many diverse uses around and you should have uh, multimodal transport so you have to reduce by 40 percent to earn this credit and in order to show that that you have fulfilled the requirements you should have uh, a parking area site plan and threshold achievement which is uh, you can get from the minimum local uh, code parking requirements and the reduction calculations which is based on the formula given below and you can earn an exemplary performance uh, if in case one no points earned reduced by 60 percent and for case two reduce by 80 percent and get an extra point for the parking calculation we just discussed in the previous slide uh, we should know that all existing and new off-street parking including parking outside the boundary is also included in your parking calculation you cannot claim that since it's outside the boundary of the uh, of the project so it's not included no if it is used by the project this parking should also be included and uh, in, in the calculation and then reduction should be done based on this and if you have a project which is using the pool parking means you have two projects and uh, one centralized parking for both of them you have to find the share or you have to state the share of your project in this pool parking and then you have to put the percentage of the reduction and in case you have a fleet and inventory vehicles uh, uh, these should not be included in the parking unless they are used regularly by the project the idea is that the fleet and inventory uh, vehicles they are coming and going and uh, they are not used uh, uh, frequently or not parked frequently but if it is uh, used uh, regularly by the project then yes they have to be included in the parking calculation now the rainwater runoff when rain falls on the roads driveways parking lots rooftops other paved services they do not allow the water to soak in means this is the natural hyd uh, hydrology in case of the natural ground cover and this is the impervious cover I'm talking about the hardscapes so in case of the natural thing the the water that is precipitated or came down as rain it should go 25% 50% inside the ground 25% deep and 25% shallow and only 10% should be the runoff this is the ideal or general hydro, uh, hydrology in case of uh, natural land cover but when it comes to the hardscape this is not the case 55% in runoff where does it go it goes to the uh, drain that that is mechanically developed and on its way to the drain it gets contaminated by metals by oils by by all the all the uh, all what you can find on the ground some wrappers some plastics small pieces so when it reaches to the facility where you have to treat it it's a burden on that so the idea is when when you reduce the hardscape you are reducing the runoff. We are going to see it in more detail as I just said when we go to the sustainable site rainwater management. Credit number eight green vehicles. It is going to earn one point in all adaptations and the intent and requirements is the same to reduce pollution by using alternative fuel uh, vehicle. Now LEED has been trying hard for, for its occupants, the building occupants and uh, users to have alternative transportation or multimodal transportation because the per head the carbon emissions is less and unless you have to use your personal vehicle it's going to uh, help you out it's going to encourage you to use green uh, vehicles now for the project in order to earn this credit you have two options number one is accept the school and and warehouse we're going to see uh, their requirements later uh, to designate five percent parking space for green vehicles so you have and, and also these parking spaces should be closest to the main entrance so you are prioritizing for the people five percent there to to give them the space near to the to the main entrance so it's kind of a privilege for the users of green uh, vehicles and for the documents you just need to submit the parking space calculations because you are taking five percent out of the total parking so you have to submit the total parking calculation and then you have to submit the photographs of preferred parking spaces and distance from the main entrance this is option one or you can go for the option two which is much easier than that that you have to provide 20 percent discount on parking rates for the people or for the occupants that are using green vehicles now preferred parking space as we just said that uh, this is the sh it has the shortest walking distance now what is a green uh, vehicle e exactly the score it it must score 45 on ACEEE -E -E. what is that American Council of Energy 
efficient engineers. You can search it online. There is a certain criteria for them to rate a, a, a vehicle as green. So now either you opt one of these options and there is another option that you have to fulfill in order to earn one of uh, uh, this one point. The requirement number two is to provide fueling stations and it has two options. But now it only says except warehouse. So it means that the requirement number two is same for schools. It says to provide EV charging stations for 2% of the parking space. And it should be a level two charging capacity or greater with standard connectors. The people who are involved with the with the EVs, they know uh, or they, they have an understanding of charging capacities and the standard connectors. And the system that is implemented for this charging station should be addressable and capable to take part in DR program. What is DR? It's a demand response program and we are going to see it uh, a bit more in detail when it comes in the energy and atmosphere credit category. And again, uh, for the documentation, the parking space calculations should be there because you are taking out a certain percent, that is 2% for uh, the parking uh, space that is to be implemented for charging station and plan showing the fuel stations, their capacity and standard of connectors. The second option would be to provide liquid or gas refueling uh, facility, gas like, like CNG gas for example, or battery changing station enough for 2% of the uh, vehicles per day. So since there is a certain percentage, you have to submit your parking space calculations and the photograph or th of the refueling facility and the battery changing station that you have implemented on the site. We have just seen that the requirement number two is the same for school and other adaptations, but for requirement number one, which is to reduce pollution by using alternative fuel vehicle, it's not the same. The reason is that school does not use the same type of vehicles that the other uh, adaptations may use. For school, mainly it is buses, and this is the reason that the requirement is that all buses, for all buses, the nitrogen oxide emissions should be less than 0.5 grams per brake horsepower, and this should be achieved within seven years of the submission of the project or uh, the certification. And this emission standard for the green bus should be met for each bus individually and not on average. So, uh, and also for the non-bus vehicles uh, uh, owned by the school, you should submit in your documentation that the bus fleet will be uh, phased in in seven years time and also the non-bus will be uh, green vehicles in, uh, in a certain timeline. And you have to submit and, and, and show this uh, as a documentation and in order to earn this credit. Below is a picture that shows a charging facility in, uh, in, in the parking lot. For the warehouse, to fulfill the same requirement of alternative fuel uh, uh, vehicle, the idea is the same. Like the school, it does not use the same set of uh, vehicles. So for the option one in a warehouse, going to give you the same one point. You should have an on-yard tractor that you that is powered by electricity, uh, propane or natural gas, which is an alternative fuel source. So, uh, and also you should have side charging and refueling stations for uh, the tractor you are using. And for the documentation, you just need to show the manufacturer of the, of the, of the yard tractor, its model and its fuel type, showing that you are using an alternative fuel uh, vehicle. And uh, you've got another option either you use option one or you can install an electrical connector for at least 50% of all dock door locations to limit truck idling at the dock. For people who are uh, familiar with warehouse, they know uh, how it could impact the, if the reduction of truck idling can impact. So you should show on uh, your documentation that a plan is there showing the electrical connector location at dock doors and calculation for number of dock doors with electrical connection. So this sums up for uh, the location and transportation credit category and we'll continue on with the sustainable side.